Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit, um, exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. Um, I'm Eva Schoenfeld. I'm here with my colleague, Nuno de Silva, who's joining us from Portugal. And Scott Brown is our speaker. Uh, Scott is a visionary peacemaker, psychologist, and life and relationship coach um, who, who brings together psychology, spirituality, nature-based healing, and transformational activism, um, and is going to speak to us today about uh, the, the worldview uh, brought by restorative justice. Um, Scott, welcome. It's really lovely to have you here with us. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Ava. Good, uh, great to be here. Great. Good. Um, I wondered, you, you said you would like to start by just touching on what you feel uh, restorative justice isn't as a kind of um, foil to what you'll go on to say. And that would be the belief in separateness. That's how I, that's what really catapulted me into this work around active peacemaking and a restorative activism lens was a appreciation for just how deep that wound of separation is. And I gather that in week one, a lot of that has already been unpacked. But I just want to say that, that I feel like that failure to really grapple with the depth of that wound and how it lives in us. You know, it's not a, it's not a them, you know, they really need to heal their belief in separateness. I mean, they, they might, but so do I, you know, it's, it's ongoing and it's humbling. And um, I need that humility, you know, to, to deepen into a restorative justice worldview, the remedy to the belief in separateness. Really, I think calling that remedy a res the restorative justice worldview really, I think, is, um, is spot on. Mm -hmm. And so just to say that, that the belief in separateness, that life-denying worldview that really pivots around that has been handed down for many, many generations. And so just to acknowledge that, that there's a healing context that I put all of my work in and that I think this conversation will unfold in mm. is that we're, we're healing together and consciously stepping into a restorative justice worldview, I think, can really um, support us in that healing. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could start by telling us a bit about your journey of both both your kind of um, journey around conflict and your relationship with conflict and how that's developed and, and I guess, you know, how you find your way to restorative justice. Yeah. Well, I grew up, at, like a lot of people in my uh, in American culture, very disconnected from myself and any sense of purpose. I didn't have really good role models. And so what I, the only thing that really ever spoke to me as something like a career was to be an environmental activist. Nature was my go-to. Nature was what kept me sane. And so becoming an environmental activist is what I did professionally for about 15 years. And I took the off-ramp just before the, the burned out activist exit <laughs> because I, I, got, I got burned out on the us versus them and everything that was being modeled for me. Um, it somehow just didn't fit this personality, you know, this, this, this being. And so I still, I wasn't totally burned out yet. So I still had some inspiration and some energy. And what I wanted to do was explore root causes. 
why are we doing this to ourselves and our planet in the first place? And what are the responses that are root responses that are, that are healing, that go to the roots? So I, that led to a lot of different kinds of training and teachers. And among those was, was restorative justice training for, for two different programs here in Colorado, working as a volunteer facilitator for those two programs, eventually running one of those programs. And, but I always had brought my activist eye to it. And I mm -hmm. realized that these principles and these practices were too good to be limited to the justice system or to schools, that we could use them to really to address the really hard issues that we're facing as a society, climate change, racism, sexism, um, you know, really the full gamut. You know, there's some, there's some requirements um, for it to be applicable. You know, there yeah. has to be a willingness. Um, the stage kind of has to be set. The timing has to be right. But it's just been one of my main inspirations is um, taking those principles and those practices of restorative justice and really bringing them out into the world outside of the justice system. And I grew up a conflict avoider, like a lot of people. And so, you know, this leaning into conflict is still uncomfortable mm -hmm. for me. And yet I know that that's where the aliveness is, that that's where the healing is. Mm. I know in my personal relationships that it's, it's when I can lean in and practice some radical truth telling and some deep listening that that relationship grows and deepens. And so I, I take that experience and apply it more broadly and think, yeah, this is this is what we need, you know? So I really feel like this conflict transformation is a gateway to our, to our healing and to healing the belief in separateness. Cause it's really, it's in relationship where we really feel how not separate we are. Right. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Those are, those are the real kind of uh, fires to sit in as those, those very close relationships. Aren't they? But the, um, the, the 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 big kind of potential that you saw in uh, restorative justice. How did that kind of how did that unfold as you kind of um, you know how did you begin to see the application to, more broadly and how does and how does that take us into that kind of worldview? Yeah, well, first just to say as, as a part of my initial training. It was the relationship skills that really blew me away the most. Mm -hmm. I was in my 40s, and I'm just now learning these basic skills. I mean, why didn't anybody tell me this, you know, when I was in my much more formative years? Um, I, it, just, it just convinced me that, yeah, this is my new path you know, to bring, to bring these skills, this awareness, this mindset out into the world. And with restorative justice specifically, it's really the five R's that I learned from my mentors here in Colorado. The five R's of restorative justice that really make it practical. Um, so just to, just to name those, the, it, the, they, and they, there's kind of a flow to them. The first one is respect. So think about that as a worldview that's so different from what we're what we see all around us, right? Respect. So basic, so life affirming. Um so challenging, you know, unconditional respect. Right? We know a little bit, you know, even the even the dominant paradigm, uh, you know, practices respect 
to some extent, but it's conditional. It's like, yeah, I'll respect you if you do this for me. And and it turns sense know, to go one way often. Yeah, if you look a certain way and act a certain way and treat me a certain way. Um, but in, in a, the restorative justice uh, worldview, it's unconditional. It's a respect for the basic dignity of every person. So it goes deep. You know, right, right, just just that much. But then the next, and so you think about it in the context of restorative justice and bringing people together to repair harm, right? So without respect, you're not going to get very far. You're probably not going to come together at all. You're not going to want to because you're probably just going to make things worse. So from respect, there's responsibility. So in a restorative justice context, often there's a party or a group of people who bear the most responsibility for some harm that happened. So you require them to take res some initial responsibility up front. In a broader context, it's just about each of us taking responsibility for ourselves, for everything about our experience, our needs, our emotions, our behaviors. And think about that in the context of a worldview and what we are embedded in right now and seeing around us. You know, there's a tremendous lack of responsibility taking. And then there's relationship is the third R. Prioritizing the relationships in the circle in a restorative justice context. You know, we come together in a circle. In a broader context, it's just prioritizing relationships, period. And understanding that it's really in relationship where I get some of my deepest universal human needs met. So to prioritize the relationship even above my own, what we could think of as self-centered um, perspective. Um, because the way that I'm going to meet my needs, ultimately the best, is by prioritizing this relationship, leaning into it, practicing respect, pra practicing responsibility. So respect responsibility, relationship, and then there's repair, repairing the harm. Um, and that to me is, is a really useful frame for our context today because for one, and in a, in a conflict transformation context, so for one, just to normalize harm, you know, we cause harm, you know, we say things um, that don't land the way we intended, you know, and our intention is not the same as the impact. And so just to normalize that, to normalize conflict and say, okay, well, when, when I cause harm, I want to repair it. That's how I show respect and responsibility and relationship. And then the fifth R in restorative justice is reintegration, which means if we've done the work of repairing the harm fully, very fully, without lingering shame, blame, and resentment, then everyone can reintegrate back into the community, back into the group, whatever the context is, um, without resentment and blame and shame. And so those five R's form a very powerful package, which to me, uh, the restorative justice worldview really kind of pivots around. So I just love the practicality of it, the challenge of it, um, the humility that it brings out, um, the healing, the potential. Mm. It, it feels, yeah, it feels re like really sort of a complete process. And, you know, imagining myself as a, as a, an injured party in a conflict to receive all of that, uh, I can, you know, I can imagine that that feels completely satisfying by the end. 
that I feel yes I've been I've been heard I've been met with respect and I, I guess it, uh, um, so in this so in a simple case like in a kind of uh, um, a sort of judicial case I can see perfectly how that would work but you were talking about applying it to climate change or you know really big really complex issues so how does that how does that work when it when it kind of gets out in the wild <laughs> yeah in the wild <laughs> I love that well I'll say in my in the book that I wrote I used the example of the the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico right. I wanted to take something big to to work with and just kind of you know apply these principles and just imagine what might a process a restorative process around healing that level of harm what might that look like mm -hmm. just to be thought provoking and so in any kind of a restorative justice context even a even a really minor uh judicial case you know some kid paints some graffiti on the school wall and has to take responsibility for that. You, there's preparation that goes into that before you bring people together, right? You have to establish that there's a restorative mindset and that people will abide by some certain ground rules. The one thing you don't want, you don't want to make it worse. You don't want to re-victimize anybody who, 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 you know, is kind of in that, in that victim place. So for something outside of the judicial system, something like the BP oil spill or um, a racist attack on somebody that maybe has been through the judicial system, right? The timing has to be right. So after the litigation, at, it's hard to keep the lawyers out, right? So after the litigation, after the protests, often, what we find is that there's still harm that hasn't been repaired, right? So six years ago when I published my book, I asked, has the harm from the, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico been repaired? The answer was an obvious no. Now it's 10 years later. There was just recently the 10 year anniversary. The answer is still no. The human cancers are just now starting to show up people that worked on the cleanup, people who live nearby. So there's all this tremendous harm. You know, people died, 11 people died outright. So preparation. So who needs to, who needs to be in the circle? And who's willing to be in the circle? And this is where it becomes very much like a nonviolent activist campaign. You know, where you have to do that seemingly impossible work of getting people to the table, in this case, into the circle, when they may not think they want to be there. Yeah. Right? It's like, it, it's such a different way of thinking. It's like, no, we're going to file another lawsuit, you know. No, I'm just going to be resentful for the rest of my life. I just want to see him go to jail, you know, so you've got to set it up and there has to be the, the willingness. And so just that much in, in my sense of it is just that much is, is contributing to planting some seeds for a different way of thinking about things, just even suggesting a restorative justice process around something like that is like wow you know I, I don't know let me sit with that let me think about it I'll get back to you but just to make it clear that it's not about shame it's not about blame it's not about punishment it's about repairing the harm all the ripple effects all the relationships and the community and we're all a part of this community so yeah thank you for bringing that actually i was hearing you and thinking like yeah so that that's that brings a lot of this sense of community which is particularly relevant when we consider that some phenomena of, of 
huge trauma like the one of the oil spill, it's based on a common practice in the private sector of externalization of, of damage in a way that then uh, obscures responsibility, respect, relationship, all the things that you mentioned that are at the base of this. So another thing that came that I want to mention, because you, ca- you might speak a bit about that, that is this sense of justice that for me was quite challenging when I started to get in touch with restorative justice, where justice is not a fixed thing, because we tend to look at justice as, as you know, you have your <clears throat> maxim, your, your uh, let's say, corollaries of justice, and that's you independent of the situation, you can use this anywhere. And I think what this brings is, or I'm sensing, and I want to check with you, Scott, is that restorative justice is more contextual. So it's like looking at justice as in always in the making. And it's in that process of trying to meet with respect, being responsible as a whole, as a community, and being in relationship with the interest to repair and to reintegrate that we are always an ongoing process of you know like composting and healing and so it's not something fixed these ideas of fixed justice are kind of part of the in a way of separation maybe mm-hmm. yeah uh, yeah i mean we could we could go deeply into a critique of the justice system and how that's not usually what results um certainly not repair of the harm and a lot of times repair is not going to be the right the right word right like when there's when people die for example when there's no getting back to normal or the way things were um this is where the phrase healing justice i think gets a little more traction um because it just has that little bit of a flavor of holding a little bit of a deeper space and so i think there can be some end points you know something something happens and if there is a restorative process for healing that harm whatever it might be um i don't know that it's always perpetually unfolding i think there can be a be a be a moment be a time when after the harm has been fully identified steps to repair heal that harm to the best of our ability have been identified and taken where we could come together and say, has it, has it been fully, you simply ask the question to the people who have been involved, has the harm been repaired to the fullest extent possible or is there more we can do? And so there's, you know, you continue to, peel back the onion and the layers and you might get to a point where people feel some satisfaction Mm -hmm. um and there's going to be a tremendous sense of i think community that gets built in the process of like that a real knowing of each other um a kind of a practice group right that's that's come together across divisions you know across worldviews to really look at something like this and so yeah that it just there's just something there's so much potential here it's sort of like what gandhi said about nonviolence that the potential for it we we can hardly fathom and i i think it's the same for this because it's so it's so out of the box um and it is living into a world view that is rooted in interrelatedness and interbeing um in the deep truth of of that and there's a very practical way to do it you know restorative justice is really tried and true um and restorative justice as it's sort of taught here in the US and other places you know it builds on all this experience you know south africa's truth and reconciliation um commission the indigenous roots of restorative justice um and i think it started really small in the justice system 
and you know the the sort of the the contemporary version of it and it it built over time because it worked and people saw how transformational it was and so i have i have that same view of restorative justice outside of the justice system what i call active peace circles is is that process outside of the justice system that i that it can it can be built over time based on its its success but it has to be done right it has to be done by people that are good facilitators and you've got to do the preparation it's not a quick fix and I don't think there is a quick fix for healing the belief in separateness. I think regardless of how bad things can seem, I I feel like I still need to train for the marathon, you know, because I don't think we're in a sprint. You know, I just because that's just the view that I hold of how things will unfold, you know, that until I'm not here anymore, I'm going to be um, preparing planting seeds for the long haul so one of the one of the questions that's that's coming to me is is um the 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 um scenarios that you've that you've told us about um seem to be ones where there's clearly a kind of um uh you know somebody who's done something bad and some people who've had something bad done Mm -hmm. to them it, does it also work in in situations that are more murky, where there's been, um, you know, bad behaviour on both sides, or or you know, where there's a lot of uh, sort of ingrained resentment on both sides? Um, Absolutely, and and that's where responsibility takes on that larger context, right? So everyone coming together. You, it starts in the same place. You know, what is the harm? Let's fully hear the harm. Everyone shares from their own perspective. I statements, not finger pointing. You know, you did this. Here, here's, here's how I'm impacted. So you hear the full extent of the harm. You get a sense for all the ripple effects, how the relationships have been impacted. And then you look at, okay, how are we, how can we repair this? So what responsibility can, can each of us take? So absolutely, you know, absolutely. It it has all this relevance for just basic group dynamics, you know, wherever there's resentments, resentments are those sneaky little things, you know, that if we don't address them um, are going to, bite us in the ass, um, are going to undermine our groups. And so here's, here's a way to hold space for unpacking and normalizing, you know, normalizing conflict, normalizing resentment. It's just sort of what we do, what we've been trained to do. Um, and here's a way to start to rewire the brain you know, to start to heal from some of that trauma. One of the, one of the things um, that really inspires me is this idea that we are traumatized in relationship and that we will heal our trauma in relationship, you know, in new kinds of relationships that are supportive, that are healthy, that are truthful and authentic. So this is the deep work. This is the deep work. You know, this gets us beyond the platitudes towards actually doing it. And so that's that's something that I I really love about it too. It's it's like, yeah, this this makes it real. You know, you had a, a point about the the kind of um the short long term yeah, because uh, Scott mentioned that this is not a quick fix. I, although I have my doubts that that many of the of the common 
public justice systems are actually quick fixes, but uh, so I would I would also question that. But it seems to me that although it's not a, a what you mean is that it's not going to be a, a, a it might not be a fast process. It will take the time it needs to take. I, uh, it left me wondering, like uh, uh, our um, dilemma, or let's say question mark around: Do we want to have short-term or long-term impacts? And I'm, I was particularly thinking about that. For instance, as I, I think you both know, I worked for some time and lived in East Timor, and and the reconciliation process there after the the occupation of Indonesia and a lot of. Uh, in fights within the the Timorese society, it was not done in a. It didn't took the time it needed to heal. So I'm kind of I've also witnessed and still witness the the result of that in the long term in terms of mm-hmm. the deep wounds that are, are are passed along from generation to generation. So it gets embedded somehow in the culture through diverse forms of violence of different behaviors that continue to generate a lot of suffering and more traumas so on the long term it's really like terrible it's it's a it's a it's a disaster somehow and i see that taking place in many in many places i've seen some good examples of 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 uh, healing and and uh, reconciliation in some parts of africa and I know Scott, maybe you have some also some experiences in work. I know you worked with the prison system a bit, uh, maybe if I'm not wrong. So that it's also interesting to see how you've been uh, observing that in works in terms of um, bringing long-term impacts to the life of communities and of people. Well, thank you for bringing that in. You know, I think that fifth R of reintegration is really a, the litmus test. If there's still resentments, then we haven't repaired the harm. You know, there's more that needs to be done. And that is what I meant by no quick fix, that it could be many circles just to, just to fully unpack the harm, just that much. And I think just that much is transformational. You know, maybe we don't even get to repairing the harm, but just to fully understand it, because I think it's so typical that all these horrific things happen and the harm is never fully understood, all the ripple effects, all the impacts to relationships and communities, because we're just not wired to think about it that holistically. So what I, what I can add to the conversation there is my experience working with youth in the criminal justice system and just the extent to which after they, I, I've worked with them after they've done their time, they're on probation or they're even off probation, but I've been able to serve as a mentor and just to understand how really nothing has been healed <laughs> um, through that experience with the justice system. And if anything, there's just more harm that's been added in. Um, so just the way that just normalizing this, this view of, of harm and repair that, yeah, there's, there's, there's harm that happened. The justice system didn't heal it. So what can, what can we do? You know, what can we do as a community to heal it? And this is another way that responsibility takes that larger frame is, you know, I, I have this sense that in general, as citizens, there, there's a way that we've abdicated a lot of our responsibility and given it away to politicians and interest groups. And that just hasn't worked out very well. And so here's a way for communities to address some of the harm that happens in the community that just isn't going to be addressed by anybody else. It's not going to be addressed by the justice system for whatever reason. Um, It's not going to be addressed by um, 
one or another nonprofit, but coming together as a diverse group of, of people, just community members, saying yes, taking the responsibility to heal it, using the principles and practices of restorative justice. Just the, there's something about just the intention of that that I think ripples out, <laughs> right? Just the intention, just the conversation. Um, we have to engage in this work not attached to outcome, right? Because it, it just may not, it may not play out. You know, we may not get, we may, may not even get into a circle together, but I think just the intention of it really starts to rewire brains um, and live us into a worldview that's rooted in interrelatedness and interbeing. I don't know if, if, if I could just share one thing, Eva. Ooh. It just to remind me of a very extreme story I heard I've seen actually in a movie called Humans. It's a trilo trilogy, and on the first movie, the first interview or one of the first, there's a, a black man talking from prison. So he's in he's in the death row. He he because he was he killed a lady and a son or a daughter. I don't remember. So it's a very extreme case, and he tells his story of abuse from, you know, family, a story of violence since he was very kid. So he grew up actually thinking that to show love, to express love to others was to inflict some sort of pain on or, or violence on them, which ended up in this kind of very extreme um, act of, of violence. And while he was in prison, he started to exchange uh, correspondence with a lady and he starts crying in the middle of the interview, you know, and saying this lady finally showed him what love really is. And the lady was the grandmother of the kid and the mother of the lady that engaged in a, in a correspondence with him to try to understand why he has done such, a, such an, act, an act, such an extreme act. And I'm, I mean, we, we, I'm a father of, of two boys, and, and I think like this is like the most extreme situation I can imagine of testing my own willingness to, you know, to find a healing possibility because I can imagine very easily to become really, you know, extreme on wanting a sort of extreme justice outcome from that, from that kind of situation. So... That really illustrates to me what just the, the act, what you were saying, just the act, the willingness to try to understand, to stay together in a dialogue, how much it can generate a huge shift in, in, in the relationship and in what that can, can generate. So, yeah. Yeah, I love that. What that brings up in me is just this sense of we're ready as a species for something new. You know, we're, we're ready for the shift. And I think these kinds of conversations can really catalyze that. And I think a lot of victims really learn, you know, they, they go through the, the, the gauntlet of the justice system and their own embedded um, tendencies, you know, to want punishment, to want revenge. And when, and when they get it, you know, when the perpetrator gets something like a life sentence or a death sentence, I think what a lot of people confront is the fact that they're still, they're not satisfied. There's more that wants to happen. And this is one of the things that, that doesn't tend to happen in the justice system is victims don't get much of a voice. You know, you hand over your power to the attorneys and the judge and the jury. And, you know, victims may get to take the witness stand for a little bit. 
but they don't get to really hear why it happened. You know, what was going on? What led up to it? What was this person's life like? And so that's one of the transformational shifts that happens with restorative justice is everyone gets a gets a voice. Victims, perpetrators. And so yeah, there's just something there's something evolutionary in play here, I sense. Um that we're we're ready for this this shift beyond punishment. And I think the five R's again really really kind of make that really practical. Give us something to sink our teeth into and lean into. I wonder just to, to finish up whether you you would kind of return to that your first point about separation and interconnection um, and just speak a little bit about the way that um, restorative justice kind of surfaces that that kind of truth of, of interconnection. Well, thank you. You know what comes up in the moment around that is the, the deeply spiritual implications of this. Um, and I'm glad that that could get named because it just has to be named. You know, there's some, you know, the belief in separateness is, is, it's very ego, it's very ego centric. It's very self centered. And the restorative justice worldview is very transpersonal, right? It's beyond the personal, it's relational. And it really gets us into, into the territory of love as the energy that really creates the world, <laughs> right? And I, and I think that's another thing that, that we're ready for evolutionarily is to really embrace the deep truth of love as kind of what we are as human beings and as what creates the world. Even the cos cosmologists these days talk about love as the 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 origin the the best descriptor of this great unfolding of being you know that's the territory we're in here is the unfolding of beingness and our fullness um our basic goodness as human beings and yeah it goes against the grain of the dominant worldview and the culture and so uh you know we're all we're all revolutionaries in that way you know revolutionaries of of love and deep nonviolence and transformation yeah and yet it's so accessible isn't it uh, and maybe particularly when you've um been through something awful and then come to understand something new about why it happened and and what it meant to you i think it it kind of naturally arises when you when you really understand what's what's been going on you know between you and another person yeah yeah we all have our you know i used to i used to think there's really there's two worldviews you know there's there's the belief in separateness and there's the restorative justice worldview let's say and I've come to realize, no, it's more like there's there's almost eight billion world different worldviews now. You know, it's really up to each of us to decide what our truth is and how it lives in us. And I can't define the restorative justice worldview. You know, here's the definitive definition. But you know, I I hope that this can help evoke. Uh, some inspiration and help people really tune into how it lives in them and how they want to bring it out into the world and how consistently they want to bring it out into the world. And, yeah. Yeah. If if I can share one one last thing that is it's kind of very alive for me is um, a part of our intention with this summit is really to kind of you know, explore together what we often see in spaces of social change where people just 
grapple with the tensions and conflicts between them, although they have a, a similar intention to bring about the more beautiful world, our hearts know it's possible. And so I, I have a, I'm, I'm leaving the conversation with a question to all of, of the people listening to this interview of looking back to um, moments of conflict and, you know, the common responses we usually have, and I'm sure all of us witness of either fighting or fleeing, did, did that kind of response... Uh, uh, healed you and left you in a place of being satisfied or not because I think this the, the, we've been exploring with the restorative justice uh, worldview another way to look into it and to recognize that we, we get uh, much um, unsatisfied by what has been the, the habitual ways to responding to conflicts Sometimes it's very tiring to be always right or to think in our heads that we were okay. right to win the fight, you know, or or to lose and turn our backs and abandon it in the moment where it was starting to get juicy. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, and thank you so much, Scott, for uh, speaking to us and spending this time with us. It's been really, really interesting. Mm. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the summit and for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. May it be the beginning of a deepening that never ends. I hope. I hope. Thank you.